good. Right, well, tonight we're drawing to a conclusion on our series that we've been doing over the last month or so on God's greatest ideas. And so I want to do a bit of a recap and I want to do a... Um, a bit of an expansion on some of the stuff that I said this morning. And uh, so tonight's great idea is, is Jesus dying on a cross. But I want to go back to the first week. Um, <laughs> lost you. How does, how does that? Oh, hooray, we're on. No, back again. There we go. Go back to the first week where... In Genesis chapter 1, verse, I think it's 27, God says, let us make man in our own image. Let us make man in our image. And it was as if God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is conferring together and trying to decide what to do. And, and the idea comes up, let's make mankind in our image. Let's make a, a male and a female who together will reflect what I'm like, what we're like says the Son to the Father, the Father to the Son, the Spirit to the Father. And together they say, let's make mankind in our image. So God made them male and female. Why? To reflect the image of God. To show, particularly the serpent, what God is like. And as he does that, he gives those people the opportunity to reflect the image of God, which is what God does for you and me, gives us the opportunity to reflect God to people. So that when people look at us, they see something of God. When people look at us, they see something of Jesus. When people look at us, they see something of what God is like. And particularly because... A bloke can't do it and a woman can't do it. But together, somehow, we can reflect in community together. We can reflect the, the love and the submission and the, the wisdom and the interaction between the Father and the Son and the Spirit. As we submit to one another and as we love one another and as we care for one another and as we give way to one another and as we agree with one another and say yes to one another and encourage one another and bless one another, we're doing exactly what the Father is doing to the Son and the Son is doing to the Spirit and the Spirit is doing to the Father. And in that whole mix of, of triune dance is reflected in our relationships, made in his image. Reflecting what God is like. So we need to be really careful about how we speak to people. How we react to people. Because it's as we do that, that we reflect what God is like. It's as we do that, that we have an opportunity to show what God is really like. Because we're made in his image. It also means that we're valuable. It means that we're important. It means that we're significant. It means that we're worth something. It means that we're not an accident. It means that God has decided to make us in his image purposefully, deliberately, as a planned act that says you are valuable. You are not an accident. You are not a mistake. There's you carry something of God in you because you're made in his image. And that was one of God's greatest ideas. He didn't need to do that. God could have created a world that didn't reflect him at all. God could have made something that, that didn't look like him in the slightest. God could have created something that was just a plaything for him, but he didn't do that. He wanted to reflect his glory through the people that he made. What a great idea. God making mankind in his image. Another great idea that we've looked at, um, which I just think is, is just so wonderful, comes from Exodus chapter 3. And in Exodus chapter 3, uh, the people of Israel have got into a real mess and they're in slavery in Egypt. And... Um, so I just had a thought, sorry, I, I don't know if you know this, but when you're preaching, you often think about other things, and uh, just as you do when you're listening, and, um, and, and I just thought, you're meant to be listening to Hannah, aren't you? You're probably all wondering, where's Hannah? Um, 
I'm not Hannah, I'm sorry. Um, Hannah is speaking in Tiptree. I'm not sure quite what went wrong, but um, she's doing a youth meeting in Tiptree and uh, so got double booked, so it's me instead. Anyway, back to where we were on God's second idea. Sometimes you, you have to let the little horses run away and you don't jump on that, that uh, digression, but other times you do. So and that was one I did. Right, where were we? Um, God's second great idea in Exodus chapter 3. God's people were in trouble in Egypt and, and God says, I have seen the suffering they are in. I have heard their cries. I've come down to rescue them. And, and the great idea is, is that God would come and rescue. And Ben talked about that a few Sunday nights ago. And that, that's just fantastic. But I really love the idea that God has created a world in which he listens to our cries. That God has created a world where our suffering is important to him. That God has created a world where he sees what's going on. And he responds to what he sees. He responds to what he hears. He responds to our cries. He responds to our prayers. And, and as we read through the Old and New Testaments, we find that, that God responds to our obedience. That God responds to our generosity. That God responds to our faithfulness. That God responds when we say yes to him. That God responds to our worship. That God responds. He's open to our input. He responds to our prayers. And it's just a wonderful thing, a great idea that God made the world in such a way that it would have input into his actions. You see, God could have, and some Christians believe he did, but, but I don't. God could have created a world where it just carries on, regardless. Or where he's already decided everything that will ever happen. Where he's just wound it up and set it off on its course. But the Bible pictures a God who is listening, who's looking, who's interested, who's open, who's given us influence, who's given us authority, who's given us delegated power. And that makes everything we do and say really significant. It make, makes so much of, of what we do vital because it affects not only our situation, not only our future, but it affects God. Because he's created a world that he is open to and will respond to. And when he sees what's going on, he acts as a result of that. So when he sees generosity, he blesses it. Any verses that you can think of about generosity... And there'll be a blessing on the end of it. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse and see that I will not pour out a blessing so that you won't contain it. If you sow generously, you'll reap generously. Shaken together, poured down, poured into your lap. Because God responds when we give. God responds to our prayers. Every verse that you can think about prayer, prayer in terms of asking God to do something, change something, make something happen, is followed by a promise that he will. And two or three agree on earth, be done for you in heaven. Prayer of a righteous man is faithful, sorry, is powerful and effective. Because God responds. He set up a world in a way that is open to our input. And that makes even the lowliest of us, even the, the most insignificant of us, and maybe you're feeling very lowly and insignificant tonight, it makes what you pray, makes how you give, makes your obedience, makes your decisions really important because God sees them and reacts to them. When they're good, he's pleased with them. He sees the suffering you're in. 
God is open to us. Third great thing, third great idea I want to talk about really briefly. The third great idea comes in Deuteronomy, and it's Deuteronomy 7, verse 7. And it's, it's where God declares his love. God declares his love to his people. And he says, I'll tell you why I love you. And he says, I love you because I love you. That's it. I didn't set my affection on you and choose you because you were the most numerous of all nations. It was because I loved you. God loves you because he loves you. And that is just so good, so liberating, so freeing to know that whatever I've done, he doesn't love me any less. So freeing to know that, that whatever I can do won't cause him to love me anymore because he loves me completely, unconditionally, faithfully. How wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And I just need to know that more and more and more. I've loved you not because you've got great A-level results, not because you're particularly good looking, not because you're particularly good. I love you not because you've made it, not because you've done it, not because you've achieved it. I love you because I love you. Brilliant. Another great idea that God has is Christmas. Isn't that a great idea? I don't mean the trees. I don't mean the fairy lights. I don't really mean Santa Claus. I don't really mean presents or turkey or Christmas pudding. The idea that God should come to us as a human being. Of course, we've already said that we're in his image, so it's, it's not a massive jump. If he's going to take a body, it's going to be like ours but that God should come to us as a baby in humility and in closeness. The intimacy between the Lord Jesus as a six pound, 13 ounce bundle of, I say that because that's how big one of my children were. So it must have been the same. This bundle of joy. And as Mary looks at him, she sees the Word made flesh, God incarnate. She sees the one who made the universe. She sees God with us. And as this little bundle of flesh starts to grow, he, he learns like we learn. And he does a job as a carpenter and dignifies all that we do as we learn and as we work. And he, and he suffers like we do, only worse. And he's tempted like we are, only worse. And God knows what it's like. He knows what it's like to be human. He knows what it's like to be hungry and frustrated and lonely. He knows what it's like to be betrayed and in pain. Because God with us. What a great idea. And then today's, I talked a bit about this morning, I'm going to talk very briefly about tonight, is that this God in Christ should die, should die for us. 
He makes the decision to go to Jerusalem. And just outside Jerusalem, he hangs on a cross. And there the God with us dies. And he's put into a grave and on the Sunday morning they can't find the body and then the Sunday evening he appears to his disciples alive. And then for 40 days he appears to his disciples and eats fish with them and tells them not to fear. He breathes on them to receive his Holy Spirit. He teaches them how to see him in all the Old Testament. He just loves them and blesses them and helps them and And then he goes on the 50th day, he goes up into heaven on a cloud and the angels appear and say, this same Jesus whom you've seen going into heaven will come back. But Jesus had promised that in the meantime there'll be another counsellor, another comforter, there'll be another part of the Holy Trinity with us. Sorry, that was on the day 40. On day 50, 10 days later, on the day of Pentecost, the followers of Jesus are together and suddenly the walls start to shake and the place is filled with the sound of a a mighty wind and there's tongues of fire that come and rest on each of them and they find themselves outside and full of the Holy Spirit and now not frightened, they're bold and they start to speak about Jesus. And Peter tells us about the death of God. Peter tells us about the death of Jesus. And this is what's recorded that he said. He said, you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. So 50 days after Jesus has died, well, 53, this is Peter's take on the whole thing. Ping. Hey, it wasn't very exciting, was it? Who put Jesus to death? You might have heard. You might have heard some people say that God killed Jesus. But as Peter looks at it, he says, no, wicked men put Jesus to death. That it wasn't a, wasn't a just thing at all. It was incredibly unjust. It wasn't a display of God's justice. The Bible says it's a display of his love. It's not God who puts Jesus to death. It's wicked people who put Jesus to death. It's an angry crowd, it's a a Roman soldier, it's a corrupt official, it's someone who bangs a nail into his wrist, someone who lifts a cross up and drops it into the ground, someone who puts a spear through his side or a crown of thorns on his head or spits in his eye or taunts him. It's wicked people who put Jesus to death. And that's where we come in the story, isn't it? That's where we come in the story. That if we'd have been there, we would have done the same. We'd have been part of the crowd saying, crucify him. Or at best, part of the disciples who deserted him. Wicked people put Jesus to death. And they put him to death because Jesus takes all the sin, all the wickedness, all the wrong, all the filth, 
all the corruption and the greed and the lies, all the conniving and the treachery, all the violence and the hate and the hurt, all the horror, all the bitterness and anger. And he takes it all into his body at the cross. And there he takes all the bile and the rottenness and the hurt and the hate into himself. And there God absorbs all the evil into the world in his body on a cross. And all the wickedness of the world is poured out onto Jesus and he takes it all. All the wickedness of the world is poured out on God in Christ and he takes it all and absorbs it and takes it into himself. And then at the end he cries out, it is finished. It's done. It's complete. It says that we put him to death by nailing him to the cross. I think we need a new battery in this machine here. Ping. Ping. It's not very exciting when we get there, I tell you. Okay, look, we'll just come up here, see if this works. <laughs> hey, yeah, hooray, there we go. Brilliant, I'll tell you what, you can keep that. Thank you. <laughs> that was a quick way of taking the batteries out. Um, <laughs> nailing him to the cross. It's very interesting that Jesus was nailed to a cross because the Jewish leaders who were the ones who really wanted to put Jesus to death could quite easily have stoned him like they stoned Stephen. But they didn't. They arranged it so that Jesus would be nailed to a cross. And very quickly, I want to say why this is. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, it says that he was nailed to a cross because at the cross he becomes a curse for us. Because in Deuteronomy, it said that cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That there's, a, there's, there's just a curse, you know, people who, on a tree, hung, cursed. By God And the Jewish leaders decided that it, if they could organize a way of Jesus to be hung on a tree, then it would be obvious that he was cursed by God. And of course, he wasn't cursed by God at all. As he hangs on a tree, he takes all the curses that have been spoken against you and me and breaks them at the cross. And Paul says that the curses are broken because Jesus has become a curse for us. That's why he was hung on a cross. And not stoned. Because at the cross he breaks every curse. And all the curses that we've spoken over our own lives. I'll never make it. I can't do it. I'm no good. All the curses that other people have spoken us over us. You're ugly. You're mean. You're always a disappointment. You weren't wanted. You always let us down. All the stuff that's been said over us is broken at the cross because at the cross he takes all our negative, all our minuses and turns them into something that's positive. He takes all that negative stuff and speaks a better word over us. And that word, of course, is a word of love and grace and forgiveness and life and purity and freedom and wholeness in Jesus. All the negative changed into something positive at the cross, from minus to plus, because he's become a curse. You don't have to carry that. It can be broken in the name of Jesus, because you are good enough, because Jesus has made you good enough. You will make it, because Jesus is holding your hand. You are clean and pure and righteous that you do have a hope and a future because the spirit of the living God lives in you click oh you've gone on two there go back one there we go it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him why really simply because 
Because Jesus was pure. Because Jesus was righteous. That Paul said that he was obedient to death, even death on a cross. Until the very last moment of his life, he never cursed God. Despite the horrors that were being poured upon him, despite the sin that he was absorbing into his body, despite the pain and the, the psychological agony and the social, being a social outcast, and the, the physical torture, he's obedient to God. And therefore, because there's always been a link between death and sin, Death couldn't hold him. Death couldn't hold him. And so God, click, raised him. Thank you. From the that was good, right? Eh? God raised him from the dead and gave him a place at his own right hand. The Lord said to my Lord, Come and sit here. God's greatest idea, to come and die. To die to break every curse over your life, to die to take all the sin and the horror and the pain. To die in order to show that death itself has been defeated. So we don't need to fear death. Jesus has been raised from the dead. We know that death's not the end because Jesus has been raised from the dead. And the glorious truth is that we can live that resurrection life now. Because the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, Paul says, is at work in you. And that same power, that same dynamic, that same Holy Spirit energy that caused Jesus to be raised from the dead is at work in us. What a great idea. I've been talking about some spiritual principles tonight, some spiritual truths, and the, um, there's often a difference between spiritual laws and physical laws. Physical laws work whether you want them to or not. You might want to say, I don't really want this bottle to fall to the ground, but there's a physical law that says, as soon as I let go of it, it'll fall to the ground. Fantastic. You see, it works every time. And uh, <laughs> physical laws work anyway. But spiritual laws, like having curses broken, like giving generously so that God can give to you, spiritual laws, like when you pray, you begin to see things happen. Spiritual laws like living in resurrection life or knowing that you're clean only work when we engage with them. So gravity is happening all the time. That's why you've not floated from your seat. But spiritual laws only work when you engage with them, when you say yes to them, when you put them into practice, when you make them happen. Because God has set up the world in such a way that he's open to our input. So we're going to stand, we're going to pray. And uh, we're going to put into practice some of these spiritual laws. We're going to engage with them. Allow the cogs to intersect. So that we know that we're loved. So that we know that we're valuable. So that we know that Our sin has been taken from us and we are clean so that we know that the curses over us have been broken. So that we know that God really loves us. So that we know something of his resurrection life in us. Let's stand together. Let's stand. Ben, do you want to come back and uh, play some guitar? Lord God, just uh, activate your spirit. Just start to... Say yes to Jesus. Just open your heart to him and allow him to demonstrate his love to you. Reach out to him and engage 
with that, those spiritual laws that say, I've loved you with an everlasting love. And just say yes to that, to receive his love because he loves you. And as that happens, say yes to the, the truth that you are valued, that you are valuable, that you're not an accident, you're not a mistake, that God has deliberately fashioned you for his purposes on earth. And we say yes to that. And we ask, Lord God, that you would bring revelation concerning that to us. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that we can engage with you in prayer. Thank you that you see our obedience. Thank you that you look upon our suffering. Thank you that you're with us in temptation and offer a way out. Thank you, Lord God. And we engage with that. We say yes to that. We open ourselves up to that. And we say, Lord God, won't you, won't you fill us with your Holy Spirit? Won't you show your love to us? Won't you increase our passion as we stir up our spirit to say yes to you? And Lord, we receive your purity and your life and your goodness. We receive your righteousness. We receive your holiness because you've taken all the filth and the sin and the anger and the wrong and the hurt and the pain and the lies and the cheating and the all of it onto yourself. And we break the curse of those words that have been spoken over us or we have spoken over ourselves. We break those in the name of Jesus. As we hear your word that you are good. I love you. You're my precious child. That you're a delight to me. That I've loved you with an everlasting love. I long for you to know how, lo how wide and long and high and deep is my love for you. I thank you, Lord God, that we can engage with your faithful love that means that we will make it. Thank you that we can engage with your love that makes us clean so that we know that we're good enough. Made righteous. Thank you, Lord God, that you have raised us up with Christ, that you have given us the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. Thank you that you have blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. Thank you, Lord God, that, that we live with you, that we live in you, that you live in us, that we have a unity with Christ, that we are adopted into the family of God, that we are in him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Thank you. Thank you for these wonderful truths, these great ideas. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit.